Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. Jesus recently re relocated to Capernaum on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, goes for a walk one day. He sees fishermen on the shore, a common sight in those days, I expect. These fishermen, well, they're low on the social hierarchy of a rigidly stratified society of the day. Other than their families and friends, few would pay attention to their work. First, Jesus sees two men, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. Matthew reports to us as to how this conversation went. Jesus was peremptory. No small talk, just follow me and I will make you fishers of people. The benefit of reading this 2,000 years later is that what we know is this is a conversation for the ages one of great importance to these individuals and to the world. As Peter becomes St. Peter, the lead apostle and one of the founders of the Christian church, Peter and Andrew do not respond as you might expect. For example, they, they don't say, well, maybe we should call a committee meeting and discuss what it is that you're asking. Or perhaps we should form a working group. I hear they're becoming quite popular. Nope. Their response, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Abrupt, immediate. No running home to grab a knapsack and tell the family that you're not going to be home for dinner. All that they know is that they will be fishing for people whatever that might mean. Otherwise, this simple invitation is void of content, remarkably devoid of content, says the theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And this happened again, just down the shore where Jesus met James and John, the sons of Zebedee, mending their nets. They too were called and immediately followed. These were ordinary people called to extraordinary tasks. And we now know that these were powerful offers. Jesus calls 12 disciples and Jesus and they find thousands more, including Paul, who attracts more as noted in the letter to the Corinthians. As fishers of people, the disciples called and encouraged more disciples. They taught others to call disciples, leading to an unbroken line of discipleship active in our church today. Remarkable, 2,000 years of continuous discipleship leading from these simple conversations. Discipleship, well, it's fundamental to the Christian church. Over the centuries, millions of people have been called to follow Jesus. While thinking about what we are called to do is an interesting question that's worthy of much discussion. I've been thinking that the first question is, who are we who are called? called not just in the formal sense, but called as seekers, inquirers, the curious, and the skeptics. If we understand ourselves, we will better understand our potential calling. Who are we who are called? I believe the answer to that to be, it's our true selves who are called. Who or what, you might then ask, is our true self? As people, we operate on two levels. Our outer layer is the self that we present to everyone else. 
We want this self to be confident, successful, strong. Our emotions are under control. We don't reveal vulnerability. We may see ourselves as good-looking and funny and appear to have our act together. Our inner self, our true self, is broken. We're all broken, one way or another, more apparent sometimes than others. There may be self-doubt, sadness, weakness, lack of confidence, trauma, and pain at this level that we really try hard not to show because we think people will think less of us, will appear weak, and the stronger will take control. Each of us probably doesn't fully understand our inner self. We keep it so well hidden that we hide some of it from ourselves. And what's keeping these two selves in line? Our ego. Now, ego is not necessarily a bad thing. We all need some of it to be our authentic self. But if we're unable to discern the impact of our ego, well, we start to delude ourselves into thinking that our outer self is our real self. So you may be thinking at this point, like, Jim, you're normally kind of an upbeat guy, and this sounds a little bleak. You know, I was thinking that too, so I sought some help. I turned to Parker Palmer for advice on this point, which I will share with you. So Palmer, well, he's a Quaker. He's a modern-day theologian. He's the founder of the Center of Courage and Renewal. In his most recent book, On the Brink of Everything, he imparts some advice on how we approach understanding our true self. He says, I'm awed by the way of embracing everything from what I got right to what I got wrong invites the grace of wholeness. He continues, I become fierce with reality. I am that to which I gave short shrift and that to which I attended. I am my descents into darkness and my rising again into the light. My betrayals and my fidelities, my failures and my successes. I am my ignorance and my insight, my doubts and my convictions, my fears and my hopes. There is a paradox in trying to make sense of our inner and outer selves. One that Thomas Merton says, to be whole, I must say that I am both shadow and light. How to become whole? We must understand that wholeness does not mean perfection. It means, as Palmer says, embracing our brokenness as an integral part of life. It means loving our broken self, looking in the mirror and loving the face that looks back at you. Loving ourselves is the first step to loving Jesus in moving forward as disciples. It invites us to give over to the mystery that lies before wholeness. It opens us to hear the truth in the whisper of God's voice, in the call of Jesus to follow him. It means understanding the role of ego. The short poem that I've included in the bulletin is quoted by Palmer, the poem titled Love by Polish-born Nobel laureate Ches La Miwash opens with the line, love means to learn to look at yourself the way one looks at distant things, for you are only one thing among many. One thing among many not the center of the universe. Each of our lives need not have special meaning beyond our loved ones. We need not drive ourselves crazy trying to answer the question, what's the meaning of my life? 
We are more simply brokenness that with the intervention of God's divine mercy and grace sets us on a path towards wholeness. Our calling is not into a make-believe world of our ego's own making, but into a real world, an authentic world, a world of brokenness where God's grace and love is active in making us whole. The concluding lines of the poem, Love, say, It doesn't matter whether he knows what he serves, who serves best doesn't always understand. There is liberation in this line for all of us. We do not decide the contact or content or impact of our calling. The impact of our call may not or be ever known to us. We serve, as the disciples Peter, Andrew, John, and James did, not knowing what we or they are called to do. We're potentially called into a dramatically changed life, as were the original disciples. Dramatic change in recognizing our broken self and moving towards wholeness. Discipleship can mean an inner journey of change. We are agents of God in our own transformation of ourselves and potentially in others. And what are the benefits of recognizing that we are called as our true selves, broken and by God's grace made whole? One is to recognize that same brokenness in others and to respond without judgment. We do not set ourselves up as better, stronger, more right, but as one sharing the journey with others, each of us being led towards wholeness. We avoid the issues of the people of Corinth that Paul wrote about in today's scripture read by Graham. Paul exhorts the Corinthians in the name of Jesus Christ that you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be knit together in the same mind and of the same purpose. Between churches, perhaps within churches, if we interact with our vulnerable selves, our true selves, collectively seeking healing and wholeness through God's grace, there will be fewer divisions. It's irrelevant too where we woke up this morning, in a condo, a tent, an apartment, a shelter bed, a house or a rooming house, we see in one another, truly see, and try to understand deep into the other who is on the same journey. Life is lived in holy community, each of us supporting the deeply seated, deeply seated desires of all of us. Our call may lead to us participating in a new direction of justice and kindness, for ourselves and for others. I wondered, who am I to stand up here in this privileged position and say these few words? Yes, I have a strong sense of calling in a few theology courses, but I'm simply one among many of all of us, leading me to believe that we are each in the same place, stumbling forward, falling, helping to pick the other up as we make our way, perhaps forward with God's grace, seeking to understand our role in God's world, our calling as disciples. My humility is of more recent origin. My previous career certainly didn't assist me in developing humility. Richard Rohr's books have helped me understand my brokenness the origins of it, and the impact on my daily life. Hospital work forced me to confront who I am as a spiritual care provider and to own my own biases, to understand that what I may be addressing is my own brokenness and not another's when I provide care. Out of this humility arises many questions, including lots of pondering about how I interact with God with effort, I believe that I have a much healthier relationship with my ego and the paradox between my inner and my outer self. 
We embrace our human frailty with reverence and respect. We are ordinary people called by God. Recognizing that we do not know the impact that we might have, grateful for God's blessing that surrounds us with love, that propels us onward with grace. And therein lies our individual and collective hope that we together are seeking the same light, that same light that guided the people centuries ago referred to in those famous lines in Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness and have seen a great light, those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. We live in the hope that our true selves, our broken selves, are called from darkness into wholeness by God's light. Understanding who we are is the first step towards our discipleship. This is a journey of hope and of courage, individually and collectively strengthened in our community. I've recently better understood the touchstone impact of the blessing that we sing to each other at the end of the worship service. The impact of this ritual wasn't, I'll admit, not fully clear to me as a newcomer. Today at the end of the service, as the choir is at the back of the sanctuary and we're singing to one another, I invite you to look across at others recognizing that in each of us is a brokenness that moves towards wholeness. See the hope in each of us. See God's grace and love among us. And for those of you who are online, if you're with someone, I invite you to similarly bless one another. And if you're by yourself, know that you are not alone that we bless you in spirit and in turn receive your blessing, that you are among us. Hope beckons us forward to true discipleship. God's grace inspires us and God's love supports us each and every day. May it be so. Amen.